Good morning, everybody. We're just going to wait one minute there now before uh, give a chance for all the other people to join. If you're anything like me, um, Zoom needed an update before I joined this morning. So we'll just give it one more minute. Okay, so good morning, everyone. You're all very welcome to the fourth webinar in our series on the building blocks for scale. Today, we're going to be discussing how a board can make all the difference when scaling your company. My name is Tom Early, and I lead the funding and scaling solutions team within Enterprise Ireland, the goal of which is to work with our clients to help them access appropriate funding to scale their business in a rapid and sustainable way. In last month's uh, webinar, we spoke with Karen Hernandez, who's a senior executive in Enterprise Ireland, and Owen Leonard, uh, CEO and founder of uh, I3PT. Uh, we discussed how the people structure of your organization needs to change as your company grows. Uh, there was practical advice on how to understand and address your company's growth needs, covering off how to handle some of the more common challenges that scaling companies face. And Owen was incredibly honest and provided really insightful experiences in terms of how he managed such rapid growth, a part of which he actually talked about was, was the board. Um, which we're going to be covering in today's sessions. Now you can listen back to that session, it's up on our website and indeed there's the recording of today's session will be available later on today and I'll post a, a link to it later on. Um, this webinar we're going to discuss uh, how having a board can help a company scale rapidly. We're going to provide some practical advice on how to recruit and build an effective board at the various stages on your growth journey. Um, a common pitfall I often see with clients is that I think the board is for the investors only and it's a reporting burden. If set up properly uh, and used right, a board can really accelerate a company's growth. So today we're going to be speaking with um, Helen Ryan. Uh, Helen has plenty of experience in dealing with boards as a CEO when she was in Ghana and later in her career uh, sitting on the boards. And she's going to share some of those practical tips how to build a strong board. Uh, and then we'll be joined by Patrick Burns, the CEO of Crew Medical, uh, a company that is rapidly, rapidly growing. And he's going to share his experience of setting up a board and how it came to uh, help him scale Crew Medical. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll open up, we'll leave some extra time at the end to open it up uh, so we can ask questions to the floor. But what I would suggest is that if you could put your questions as they occur to you in the Q&A chat, and then we'll go through them uh, later on. So look, without any further ado, I would like to invite uh, Helen onto the camera. So Helen has over 25 years experience in the medical and device industry. Uh, she was eight years a CEO in Kragana Medical and grew the company five folds to become the largest indigenous uh, medical device company in Ireland. Uh, now she's an EI board member and a member of plenty of other companies. Some of them you may know the names of, like Cree Valve, Warm Projects, Atrium Medical, Timphony Medical, Blue Drop Medical. Um, so she has quite a, an experience in terms of board. So Helen, you're very, very welcome. Thank you, Tom. Um, and again, thank, thank you very much. I was just going to talk for a few minutes really on the benefits of having a board, particularly as you go on a scaling journey. And I've called out a few areas that I think are important, but you know, it's, it's absolutely not an exhaustive list. So for me, firstly, it's the working on the business, which really has taken the time to think strategically you know, and consider a medium to longer term time horizon and sort of work on things that are important for the business, but maybe not yet urgent. Um, and I think we all get we all get caught up in dealing with the what's urgent today. So this is kind of taking the time to step back. But I think if you are considering a board or if you have a board, you must have a board that brings an external view, because I think that's essential really in asking the questions that are important for both strategy development and strategy execution. And, you know, even the process of having board meetings and preparing for them, and it will allow you to get out of the kind of busy day to day and maybe figure out what is most important for the business and what plans you need to put in place now and execute against to be successful on the scaling journey in the medium term. And I think in general, in general, we don't create enough space or time for strategy. I mean, it is very difficult 
uh, when you're in a growing business and I think particularly a business that's growing rapidly. So for me, it was always one of the key benefits of having that external view that the board can bring. It kind of brings you back to strategy on a very regular basis. And, you know, on that point, I do think it's really important uh, that you create a board that does bring that external view. And I, it had come up over and over again in, in a lot of the things I have to say, but um, what I will come back to it at the end, just to maybe a couple of key things to consider as you might be putting a board together. But um, again, for me, if you consider the kind of general operation of the board, you know, the structure of reporting to a board, and that can help drive kind of performance and accountability, you know, in that you have this external crit critique of the performance measures that you believe maybe are important for the business. Um, and you probably will get some very helpful input on those, maybe on are they the right ones for the business at this point in time? And have you actually got good measures uh, for them? You know, and then as you report against them, you can actually use that process to drive accountability and a focus on delivery. You know, and in general, your board should, should be distanced from the day to day and maybe be a bit less tolerant of the kind of usual excuses why things didn't get done. And I think that can start to help the organization in developing more robust plans and then actually delivering against those plans. Um, another key area that I would see I would have benefited from myself, and, and I, you know, I can see it on lots of boards I sit on, is really the mentoring that your board members can give the CEO and the senior leadership. And really, as you as 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 you get exposure to board members, you know, it can be very impactful if you listen to the type of questions they ask, getting their thoughts on maybe challenges you have in the business or challenges you might be facing. You know, but but also having that sort of supportive sounding board for, you know, maybe new ideas, new markets, new products. You know, it's really a great learning opportunity, uh, you know, for a management team. But I think also maybe a beneficial in a kind of a one to one mentoring at a personal level, uh, particularly for the CEO. And that can be very helpful, I think, in in your leadership development, you know, and helping you on the journey of scaling and maybe some of the tough decisions you need to make along the way there. Maybe the next slide, please. So I think this area, it's probably an obvious benefit, um, but you know, I have to say you have to attract the right people onto your board, first of all. Um, and you really want people that have knowledge and skills and experience that you can tap into and kind of not just strategic management, like as mentioned earlier, but also in areas like getting into new markets, attracting new customers, you know, considering new geographies, um, and then you know, maybe new products, but also things like raising capital and you know, either either debt or equity. And I would think that very often you can't attract or necessarily afford someone with the experience or skill level that you can potentially get in a board member. So it can be a very effective way of getting access to, you know, some some really key knowledge and experience. And, you know, if I think about from my own experience, I would say that that in my time as CEO, I would say that I benefited hugely from being able to tap into those and maybe just one or two examples we had. Um, in the early days in Kragana, we had a director on the board who had spent a lot of time working in Japan. And like he was really helpful in sharing the kind of practical experience in winning business in Japan, you know, and 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 making sure that we sort of had a, a, a program. We committed to these regular visits to customers for, for a year to 18 months uh, to actually engage the customer, you know, to let them know that we were serious and not expecting to win any business, you know, in that early period or in that first year or so, and actually kind of sticking it out because, you know, if you looked at other markets, we'd generally have thought after a second or third visit, if there wasn't a hint to getting some business, you'd be inclined to move on, you know, but he was very helpful in saying it's very different in Japan and here's how you need to do it. And, you know, I think was helpful in, 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 in uh, encouraging us, if you like, to, to, stick, to stick on the journey. Um, another one in, in another company I'm part of, I saw, you know, that I could see is where you had somebody on the board who really was a very seasoned financial person um, and was involved in a number of companies. Um, and this company was borrowing money and the first terms I guess they got from the bank were, were anything but competitive. And again, he was really helpful in being able to say, you know, this is, this is competitive, this is at the market, but, you know, these terms aren't and you need to go back and negotiate and here's where I believe you can get those two based on what he was seeing. So just, just very helpful. Again, with the right people on the board, you can tap into their contacts. You know, you can ask them to introduce you to potential customers or clients again one that I would have found extremely helpful and would have used an awful lot. And, and particularly what I found was that you could get introductions 
at maybe a fairly high level in your customer organizations, you know, which meant you weren't trying to work your way from the bottom up, you're actually kind of coming in at the top. But I think also helping understanding how some of those bigger organizations worked, you know, like what different people were sort of um, incentivized to do, how the budgets worked, and therefore, you know, you could really get your picture, your proposal fine tuned um, as you met some of these senior people, you know, to make sure that how you were, how you were putting you know, basically your proposition forward was actually going to really, really work for them. Um, another, another advantage, I think, if you can get, if you can get the right people, um, is people who have been uh, either part of or been on a, on a scaling journey with a business before. And again, you know, they know some of the pitfalls and they're able to help you maybe navigate some of them. And again, in my own experience, you know, there were, there were a number of times along the way where customers were asking us to do a lot of like holding inventory and moving to Kanban type arrangements. And obviously there were big impacts on cash flow for the business in doing this, but, but equally these were big customers. So you felt you had to, you had to be able to, um, to respond to them. But, you know, we did have, we did have one director at that point in time who had some very good insight onto what our customers were actually trying to achieve by asking us to do these things. And sometimes we were able to, you know, give them a solution that, that answered their needs, but that didn't actually maybe have the same impact on things like our cash flow or maybe capital investment that we'd have to make um, at, the, you know, at the same time. So I think a whole wealth of experience and skills, if you can get the right people that you can tap into in a very, you know, in a very effective way. And maybe the next slide. And then kind of the third area I'll just comment on um, is around governance. And I think it's a pretty hot topic this week, particularly. Uh, and a little bit about credibility. And I think on governance, you know, the key benefit I see there is having, having a board, there's a level of control that you get again from having that external view. And directors have a fiduciary responsibility. And in my experience, they all take that very seriously. And they will want to make sure that everything is in control, you know, and that there's a reasonable approach to risk management. And I think these are particularly important as you go on a scaling journey, because, you know, you get to a point where you kind of can't keep all these things in your head or you, you have to allow um, the organization make decisions, particularly around risk. So you need to have some good uh, policies and procedures and good controls in place for that. So I think, you know, I think they, they are really important and they're, they're going to be really important you know, if you have if you have existing investors, but particularly if you're trying to bring in new investors and their diligence in your company, or even if you're considering exit, um, you know, for a for a partner who's potentially going to acquire your business. I mean, I think governance is really important. And the other thing about the, the credibility, I think really, you know, your the credibility of the company. Uh, externally can be enhanced if you have the right people on your board. You know, your value proposition would be considered to be validated like by these board members. And if, you know, if they're seasoned industry people, then I think that can be very valuable. Again, particularly if you're trying to raise, um, if you're trying to raise money or, or if you're considering exiting the business. You know, and I think the support of board members, it also enhances the credibility of the CEO, which again is really important for investors, but also for customers and also, you know, in winning, in winning new business. Um, so then maybe just to, to conclude, those are what I think are the benefits, you know, or the value you can get in a, in a whistle stop tour from a board. But I, I think for me, the important thing really is that to get those benefits, you actually have to get the right people. And if I go back to the beginning again, you have to get people who bring an external view. So really for me, there's no point in having a board that's primarily made up of the senior management of your business or your friends and family, um, unless you have a very exceptional set of friends and family. Uh, you know, that you really need to recruit people who have deep industry knowledge, you know, ideally maybe have been on the scaling journey or part of or been directors of, of other businesses that have been on scaling journey so so that they have that. And I mean, in that way, you can actually start to, I think, reap all of all of these benefits. But it's also for me, it's really important to make sure that you have uh, clear contracts in place for directors. So directors contracts, and I think in particular around the term of the contract. Um, because you will need to refresh the board as you scale. You know, there's there's maybe a skill set you need early in the journey, and then there's possibly a different skill set you need as you get further on in that journey. So you need to be able to manage that, um, you know, effectively, and, you know, that, that you have some limit on the term. So if you appoint a director, they're not necessarily there for as long as, as, as they want. It's for as long as it makes sense for the company. And, 
I, I also think, and I know Tom kind of mentioned this at the beginning, you know, if you have gone through, you expect to go through a number of rounds of funding. I think you need to be smart in how you manage investor directors um, and the number of investor directors you end up with. You know, you don't want to end up with a board that's actually just stacked with investor directors. So I also think that that process can be easier, uh, you know, if you have strong non-exec directors already on board, you know, particularly maybe if you have a strong chair that you can sort of help manage that situation. But, you know, not to be af not to be afraid as you're going through rounds of funding, sort of not to be afraid to push back on that and to have like side side meetings with investors as opposed to having them all necessarily sitting on your board. Um, that was pretty much all I was going to say. I'm happy I know at the end there's a, there's a question piece. So I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, brilliant, uh, Helen. Thank you so much. That, that was really insightful. So I'd like to invite um, Patrick Burns, uh, the CEO of Crew Medical, to come on. So, so Patrick has 15 years uh, experience working in the ortho orthopedic medical device industry, and you've had loads of different roles with multinationals. Um, but you took up the reins in was it 2018, and now you're you're looking after Crew Medical. You've got over 180 professionals in this space, and you've managed to grow sales at least least three times uh, their, their current value when you took over uh, and it's continuing that upward sweep. So, so Patrick, you're very welcome. Thanks, Tom. Did that intro do you justice? Yeah, I suppose just yeah. to caveat that, it's important to, to, to mention that um, the sales and the growth wouldn't have come if we didn't have the previous 35 years experience that was there already. So <laughs> I'm yeah. just a better, that's it at this point. Okay, good. Well, you, you might actually just give us a little bit of a, an overview of Croom and, and what it does. Sure, yeah. So uh, Crew Medical is a joint replacement contract manufacturer. So we manufacture joint replacements, knee systems and hip systems on behalf of OEM companies um, around the world. Uh, I suppose up to about 2015, we were doing it locally, so just Irish focused. And since then, we have managed to impact um, external markets, particularly in North America. Okay, all right. So, so because you then that probably explains your very rapid increase in size. Like, by, I think at last year you you increased your sales by one hundred and twenty percent, and your staff went from twenty six in twenty eighteen, and now there's about one hundred and eighty that you're at. So, so that level of growth must have brought some headaches. Uh, how did you go about handling it? A lot of creative conversations, all right. Um, so over that period of four years, we also took on minority investment externally. So this company, being uh, indigenous, um, was basically uh, taking on external uh, investment as well, which is another tricky conversation. But um, over the past uh, two years in particular, it's fairly significant growth, um, as you mentioned, but a lot of all good stuff, right? But a, a lot of challenges along the way, uh, particularly when you're offering products to a highly regulated market, it brings a number of challenges and really stress tests your infrastructure and your framework across the management team in particular. Um, and that's something that really... Uh, we were probably alluding to that the board really put a back our seal in the back there in relation to uh, ensuring it was delivered on time. Okay, and and would you have involved in the board in your growth plan? Like I'm, I'm assuming you know this all didn't just accidentally happen to you, but you you know you actually came up with a strategy and a plan. Sure. Yeah. So so back in uh, 2018, we actually made a systemic focus to look at what differentiate us from our competitors, right? So um, essentially it was doing the, the deep digging in relation to industry reports. Um, we also uh, engaged with Enterprise Ireland on the international selling program to understand what our customers were looking for on an international level and also to understand what good looks like. Um, and with that, then we, we formally engaged in a, a research and development board. So it wasn't a formal board. They didn't have director seats on, on, on the actual company's um, company level, but we did recognize the fact that if we are going to be really serious about research and development and differentiating ourselves from competitors, what would be the first step in this regard? And it was really about putting a framework and manners in place. Um, so at the time, it was um, it was actually visiting an IR, IR, IRDG uh, webinar um, in that was held in Dublin. Um, mm -hmm. And from there, then we realized that the thought leaders within our space, right, was added manufacturing. So it was all 3D printing and metallics. Uh, looking to see where this space was going over the next four years and what our customers could potentially look for. And those thought leaders all existed within Central Europe, um, University of Leuven, and also um, University of Munich. So with that, then we started to draw parallels as to who in Ireland would be in a senior level within these institutions. Um, and luckily enough, we found one. And uh, we brought 
him onto our R and D board then very early on, and that's when really the stone started rolling, um, because it really put manners on our team here internally, and it really pushed us to kind of invest in the brains really, um, early on to see exactly how we could um move this whole whole train along, you know. So, so ju and just so I'm understanding this correctly, you basically identified a sales plan or an area that you wanted to go to, and then you went, right, I need to get access to these areas. So you actually said, I'm going to use a board or uh, getting an advisors on board so that they can open up the doors for me. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of it was pushing open doors, right? To be honest, yeah. with you. when you have, and Helen mentioned it previously as well, it's so important to get, when you have a good person, you realize yeah. That you should have done it two years ago, you know. So it's um it's so important to get the right person. And in many respects, they'll find you in some regards. If you start looking in the right areas, um, you know, you you'll know when they're in front of you. Um, and for us, that's certainly what happened uh, area. Okay, so so if you look at like say 2018 and how you were set up versus how you're set up now, your growth strategy, like so I'm imagining that was your the, the management team, it was you all of you sitting around, you developed your strategy, you identified that you know you needed to bring on a bit of advisors and a board, but now you've actually set up a board. And so, you know, how do, how does your strategy differ from pre that board coming in versus that board in there now? So I suppose the R and D board was seen as informal, right? We still mm -hmm. met 10 times a year and there was meeting minutes. Um, technical files were built out and financial files were built out for, for R&D tax credit purposes. So we did a full um, trial run, if you would, prior to the establishment of a formal board. Mm -hmm. so when we took on minority investment here in 2020, um, there was a request for a minority board to be to be, to be installed. But we already had kind of the trial rehearsal done, if you'd like. So, um, yeah, it, from there, it just pretty much, uh, it was in, in, in synchronization with the strategy from there on. So the sales plan that we did back in 2018, although we realized it at an accelerated pace, right? Um, mm -hmm. The board were very understanding of where we came from, where we wanted to go. Um, and that then kind of gave them confidence in, in as we were putting that board together, we were also hitting hitting our targets as we went. So it's, um, it's just important to do what you said you do when you, when you yeah. talk to the boards, you know, it's all about, and if it's not measured, it's not managed. So um, having that framework and, and those manners in place up front, just to manage people's expectations is, is, is don't undersell that. Um, yeah. That's certainly one thing that's been a key pillar for us. And so do, well, do, it's a bit of a loaded question, but I mean, have you, have you found it to be a bit of a curse having a board or like uh, by and large, it's actually significantly helped your business? Like, like, would you have always been of the opinion that prior to 2018, I need a board or no, they just get in the way of me doing things. I just need to make decisions quick. Uh, initially, you can, I, I could understand how you'd see it that way, right? Because it's all in your head and you think that, you, you know, they should know what I'm thinking, right? But the reality <laughs> is that, you have to educate the people around you and invest the time up front because you know six people are far better than one in terms of of getting stuff done um and it's particularly when, when as helen mentioned when you're looking for finance externally um the term sheets that you're presented with you know you could be you could chasing yourself mm -hmm. for 12 months realizing that what i was given day one was completely different to what my competitors have and having that board member in place um, will really kind of make those quick decisions and save you a lot of time. So what I would say was invest early in your board. Um, definitely for us, anyway, we couldn't have done it soon enough. Okay. And and so then uh, talking about your board and building up, like so the, it was obviously a minority, um, it was a minority, what you call it, like a, a, a shareholder wow. coming in that, that that said, right, we need, you yeah. need to set this up. So was that like just the catalyst and you were ready to go or how did that work? Pretty much, yeah. It was a it was a catalyst. We already had it um, working anyway from our research and development side of the business, so it was just pretty much a formality and continuation of that. Okay, brilliant. And and so then when you went about recruiting, like did did your investor say, oh, you need to put this on the board and you need to have this on the board and we want five seats or you know how did it work with with that? How did you or was there a need for you to push back or? Uh, there was a need to push back initially. Yes, there was. Um, so, you know, uh, certainly from that aspect of things, it's having those side conversations and realizing that, you know, not everyone needs to be at the table here. Um, it's it's also important to to to, uh, to recognize that the book stops with you. So if you're the managing director or, or the CEO or a senior member of the organization, the board are there as an advisory measure um, mm -hmm. to kind of prompt you. But it's important to keep that balance in your head that reality is whatever happens next is up to you. Um, so it's just, you know, it's a take with a pinch of salt in many regards, but at the same time, 
I would say nine times out of ten, it's certainly um it's certainly a positive move if you have the right person. And it's all about the right people, right? Because when you're trying to grow, you need good people around you. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that that it's, it's ongoing, right? For for everyone um at the minute. But um getting the right people is so important. So being able to kind of make a meaningful difference to your to your calendar year, should we say. Well, that's a lovely segue into my next question. So how did you go about actually recruiting your board members then? Like, like did you sit down and think about the profiles, the skill sets uh, aligned to your strategy? Or was it, well, I just need to go out and get help and somebody will help me recruit these? I, I think that what we did was um, we spoke to a few people in relation to who was in manufacturing already, and particularly in medical device manufacturing. But to be honest, it was all about the gut feeling and the attitude at the end of the day. Right. Would this person make you get on that plane to go and visit x y and z on a sunday night you know the kind of way you just need some bit of a push and that's how we really kind of we got blessed with our non-exec chair in that regard um and outside of that then it's pretty much you know when you meet someone again that this person could have significant value to our team over the next time period um and it's just about really bringing them along with you Okay. And I imagine, right, so so you've alluded to the fact that, you know, the you started off with an advisory board, then you ended up with a, a formal board. So has your board evolved, I suppose, for want of a better word, as you, you, as your company progresses? Do you swap in, swap out members? How does, how does that work? Uh, since we haven't swapped any, anyone out, no. But we will be adding people in over the next uh, couple of months. Um, so, yeah, for us, again, you're looking for a different skill set every time according to what's going on externally in the macro events within the business. So, it's a, you know, just recognize that at the time. You see it six months out and, it's, a, it's you know, it's, it's a good prompt really to start engaging with external parties. Okay, okay. And it, one of the questions that's that, that that's come in here is actually about um, how did you go about incentivizing your board? Uh, like, you know, um, I, I suppose not not one size fits all. They're all looking mm -hmm. for different things. It's just understanding what motivates certain individuals and and um, yeah, kind of kind of coming up with a hybrid solution that would fit them. You know, mm -hmm. um, the, the whole the whole premise of this is to make it work. Um, yeah, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to create a critical mass to move everything along, and you know. At a certain velocity, whatever you, you feel, either in, in nationally or internationally. Um, and I think that if that person has enough value and you feel it, well, then it's time to come to the table and be be honest and transparent and, and, and truthful in what you're meaning to do, you know. Okay. Um, what I would like to do now is I'd like to throw it open to a few more questions. So I'll invite um, Helen Ryan uh, back on and Owen O'Kane, uh, part of our team here as well, is going to 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 help me in terms of all the questions, because this is a flood of questions I can see uh, uh, filing, filing in there. Um, one of the questions, actually, uh, Helen, is, you know, when do you think the right time to set up a board is like so when when would you actually say oh you need to do that now or you should have done it yesterday um yeah you know i i think early it is a good thing to do early in the journey um and it's mostly good because of the kind of structure and discipline right but i think to some of the points that patrick was making sometimes if it's too early in the journey you you might find it difficult to attract the right people or you get into that loop that you bring people on and then they you know you outgrow them very quickly or something so mm -hmm. i would think you know that the route that patrick went and i see a lot of companies do it um that if you don't have an external investor driving the absolute need for a board on day one that the route of kind of advisory boards is a good way to go you know and you can consider that for things like strategy uh, like Patrick did for R and D, for you know different areas, just pick pick some key things in the business, and it's a way of getting to know people. Because I know there were a lot of questions on that, you know, how do you find the right people? How do you? But but like a lot of it is kind of gut feel, you mm -hmm. know, and you'll you'll find the person. But an advisory board is often a way where you don't have to make a big commitment, you know, and you might only ask a person to be involved, you know, for a year as you as you do some like R and D work some new products or new markets or some other piece of strategy development. And then you can see, are they people that could make a difference to the business long term? But I don't there's any right answer to that, unfortunately, Tom. <laughs> no, okay. no, no, that, that's good. Yeah, one of one of the 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 things that's there is uh, you know what's the old, the old expression you know who pleases the police sort of thing. So if the board is at the very very top, uh, and somebody's put it very nicely, you know, do do you set up KPIs for them? Like how do you how do you monitor their performance? How do you stop them from being non value add or disruptive force mm -hmm. on 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 the board? Like I imagine that takes a bit of negotiating or or something. Yeah, and. 
again, I'd say from my point of view, I don't know that KPIs, uh, you know, I don't like, I, I can't, I, I've no, I haven't seen that anywhere and I have difficulty seeing how that might work per se. But I think what is reasonable to say, like as you recruit somebody, you, you know, you're clear on some of the time commitment that's needed. And maybe you're clear on saying, you know, I, I will be asking you to give me introductions you know, and are you okay with that? Or I will be asking you to do this or this or this, you know, for the business. And before you engage someone that that you're clear kind of directionally what you're going to want that person to do. And again, quite a bit of it will come back to that sort of gut feel. You know, you're saying, yeah, I see how this person is, is up for it. I, you know, I believe this person will give me the introductions, you know. Um, and I think the only way you can you can really address and again, this probably comes back a lot to your chair that you can address the overall board performance. I mean, it is within most of the corporate governance codes that you would do board effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So it, it is it is an option, you know, that you could run a sort of a board effectiveness survey. And, you know, you, you, you sort of ask the directors how they think they're doing and then, you know, you, you ask maybe others how you think they're doing. Um, it it. It probably does get a bit difficult if you get misaligned with your board, though. So I'd say, you know, as the CEO, um, there's a bit of management, you know, they're another stakeholder in the process and there is a bit of management of that. But, um, you know, you, you'd almost have to try and make sure you don't get into that position. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you could identify as a one director that maybe isn't going the way everybody works and you have to get the chair to work with you then to see you know, can you bring that person in line or is it time maybe for that person for that person to go? But I guess the other thing you do need to watch because you have all the benefits, as I said, you have all the benefits of these these people's credibility as they come into your business. You need to be careful that there isn't a big negative if you exit them out of it. You know what I mean? And that that's done in a way that doesn't damage their credibility and therefore that won't damage your credibility. So, you know, there, there is quite a bit of management. I would say you need to manage your board in the way you manage, you know, your most your most important customers. Um, Just talking about that, Helen, and, and board design. Um, and obviously yeah. there was a question around KPIs. There's a couple of questions around contracts um, and, yeah. and how long, you know, you might expect a board member to be present. Um, any insights to share, both from, you know, your experience sitting on boards and then also so being the CEO and designing uh, the optimal board structure. Hmm. Um, well, well, I would say first of all, for a for a board, you you ideally want your your chair to be a non exec. I would say ideally. Now, in some cases, there are businesses who maybe have a founder or CEO who's stepping back and has a lot of knowledge in industry, and they maybe it's it's a perfect transition, you know. But I would say ideally, you want your board your um, chair to be non exec. And I would say on most boards around six to seven is a pretty good number. Uh, and ideally within that, I would say if you have a seven person board, you want four, you want three of them to be a minimum of three to be non-execs. And then you might have an investor, you might have a founder, you might have, you know, if it's a family business or whatever. Um, so that kind of balance. And again, that goes back to my point about the external view that you have roughly half the board are bringing you know, this key, and it allows you get a number of skill sets in there as well. So you can target people who have different different skill sets. I mean, on contracts, in my view, you should be looking at probably something like a starting with a three year term with an option to extend that because it might suit you, you know, um, it might suit you. But I would say in general, um, you know, people who, are, and I have to be honest here, I've been sitting on the board of Enterprise Ireland for nine years myself now, I am. I do have to step down fairly shortly, but I was going to say, you can't have people around too long. Mm. Um, but I would think there is kind of an upper limit. And, and that that was kind of one of the points I was trying to make early. As you scale, you possibly need different skill sets. And therefore, I would think probably, you know, if you're on a fairly serious scaling journey, probably three to five years in, you know, your business looks very different than it did when you recruited you know, those board members. So having the option. Occasionally, if you get investment along the way, they might drive that as well. Like the, the investors might want to uh, bring in somebody with different skill sets. Um, that's, I, um, I was just going to say that's an, uh, a nice segue into an additional question that's come up. And, and obviously something I've heard from both yourself and Patrick is obviously being very intentional around board design. Um, yeah. and, and the question that's come up is, you know, and Patrick, it was what are the three most important factors and methods that you've used to attract the right board members? And Helen, obviously you mentioned in your experience, you know, 
grown into Japan uh, and how critical your board member was. Um, and Patrick, you talked about obviously thinking about the sales plan that you had and then using the board as an extension of the management team to help you drive that sales growth. Um, so maybe just get some of your insights on you know, how you how you would go about um, designing and, and bringing the right people onto your board. So I suppose for us, um, initially, there was three factors. It was pretty much social proof, academic proof, and industry proof, really. So it was all about your networking, uh, professional network in particular. Um, going to conferences and shows just to bring it back, like even from the R&D perspective, we just wanted to see who were the thought leaders in that particular space that we were looking at. And we attended the conferences both nationally and internationally. And the same names kept coming up and the same names kept getting asked to speak. So uh, that's how we kind of found our, our R&D uh, board members. and then from the form and strategic board, it was we wanted someone who's been there, done that. Um, particularly as a growing SME, from our perspective, the finance function in particular needed a lot of work um, to grow at that scale. And that's something that the board, from our side of things, having that um, financial background from company, or from experience that has been there, done that in other companies, um, was worth its weight in gold. So it's really understanding what you need in the, in the immediate, right? The medium to, to, to the and the, the medium term. So um, six months to eighteen months out, what you're looking at and uh, how can you pull those expertise in and just recognizing it. And you might be able to recognize something that um, you know even an advisory board uh, member may be able to recognize and just bouncing the ball off the wall there to see, right? This is where we are. This is where we want to go. What do you think the skill sets are needed? And um, Patrick, I might, might just because I, I saw you nodding a good bit there when when um, uh, Helen was talking about managing a board and and stuff. You might just take me through the practical uh, sort of things that happen. Like, do you meet with the chairperson by yourself and discuss the board meetings? Like, are they regularly set up once a month? Is there an agenda set well in advance? Like, maybe just yeah. talk me through the practical stuff there. Well, our one was a, a strange one, really, because even our non-exec chair, we met him, it was all through COVID, right? So this is all established over COVID. Right, so okay. everyone was met virtually. Um, we didn't formally actually meet them face to face for nearly nine months in. So it was a it was a, a it was um I suppose a product of of consistent communication either by teams or phone calls. And it's all about communication, really, and mm -hmm. being honest and transparent. So with my non-exec chair, I formally write for one call a week that goes on for about an hour. That happens every week regardless of what's happening in the business even if it's a quiet month a busy month um it might only last 15 minutes that's fine but you have to have that call to see what's going on and then during busy periods it could be five times a day you know it just depends on what's going on in the business but it's all about communication and you're reliant then on that um, non-exec chair to basically communicate to the wider members of the board on an as needed basis to basically uh, effectively communicate there there afterwards but kind of comes back to uh emotional intelligence i suppose you could say and recognizing that you know, someone's not consistently pulling against you, and then it's time to have a more broader discussion. Okay. Okay. Uh, very good. Um. And and Helen, because I'm just conscious of the time here, so I know if you've got any last questions, maybe maybe think of it. But Helen, just uh, I might give you uh, ask you if there's any practical tips or uh, in terms you can provide people in terms of recruiting or setting up a board. Um. Any advice you would pass to people? Yeah, and may, maybe the, the first thing I'd say is that, you know, and I think Patrick mentioned it there, it's kind of the networking. Go out and meet a lot of people because, you know, there's there are lots of people probably with the skills that will be helpful to you, but you have to make sure the people you're going to get on with and people, you know, you can have you can have good conversations with, but also people will challenge you a bit. You know, you can't if somebody is just going to agree with you all the time, it won't be beneficial. So I would say get out and meet lots of people, you know, and, and don't necessarily say that you're meeting them because you you're you're looking for board directors some people actually will be happy about that other people will possibly back away you know i'd have to say my first interaction with crewman I, I think obviously they're a brilliant company and you know chatting to patrick and you know he he was initially asking me if i had any interest in that and i said oh my god i'm just way too busy to take something like that on so you know be careful but obviously then i got involved in a kind of a more advisory capacity and um, so so you know, so be careful how you do, but get to know people and make sure you're going to be able to get on with them and they have that right balance of, you know, people you're going to get on with, you're going to like, but also will challenge you. Um, you know, and I'd say, I would say it, from an industry perspective, like LinkedIn is such a great resource, like you can scan there and you can find like lots of people in, let's say it might be your customers 
you know, or maybe they're X some of your big customers, or they're X some of the big customers you'd like to have, or they're maybe X some of your competitors, you know, so, so it's very easy to kind of find the people there and then find, you know, as Patrick said, maybe more conferences they go to, you know, um, my, my experience is that most of these people, particularly those who are sort of maybe X big corporates, are always happy to do a half hour phone call you know, as a starting point and often are happy to introduce you to other people who may be beneficial. You know, I have always been surprised um, at how uh, how companies have managed to engage some very, very key people, you know, as as directors. And a lot of these people you were talking about incentivizing um, a lot of these people, you know, want the involvement as much, you know what I mean, that they they buy into what you're doing and they want to be involved in it. They want to see you being successful. And it's kind of less maybe for a lot of them, it's less about the check you might pay them or maybe the piece of equity you give them. Um, you know, and if if they're if they're looking for too much money early on, you know, in an earlier stage in a business, I would be kind of saying maybe they're not the right people. Yes. But it's networking, it's you know, and I'd say talk to lots of people, like don't just don't don't just sort of engage the first person you come across that appears to the skill sets you're looking for. I, I, for want of a better word, you know, you wouldn't do it if you were recruiting for an accountant or a salesperson. You wouldn't just the exactly. first person you met. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think was, you should reference people. You know, you shouldn't just necessarily take them, you know, at, at face value per se. You know, like, as you say, if you're recruiting someone for a job in your business, you'd actually get references or you talk to other people about them. So I think that's, you know, that's really important, too. But but ultimately, it has to be. They have to be people who buy into what you're doing and you have to, to Patrick's point about managing them and having having been a CEO and having to manage um, a board, they have to be people, you know, you're going to get along with, um, you know, and that you're going to be able to have the right kind of conversations with. Okay. And um, Patrick, may come to you, uh, somebody who's living and breathing this at, at this particular moment in time. I mean, any advice, tips that you would pass on to, to our listeners today? No, oh, I suppose it would be Helen mentioned it earlier, and she's right in relation to you need someone that's going to push you because as a CEO or managing director, it can be a, a lonely place at times. But yeah. quite often you'll suggest something and you're always told yes, you know, you're, you're never told no, <laughs> or that's a bad idea. And that's what you're looking for, really. You want a board that's being honest with you and being like, listen, I don't think this is a good idea because X, Y, and Z, but maybe you should go about it this way. And that that the whole premise here is to move everything along. So um that's probably the main advice. And again, it's it's talk. The more the more you talk to people um and understand who moves in what circles and, you know, what motivates them. Uh, particularly, the, the, sorry, the ex-corporate uh, area is a, is a really good spot for finding people that have been there, done that, um, and they understand, uh, in many regards, how your customers think um, on an international level. So that, that's my only input, is the network more, if you can. Okay, and actually, there's one last question, which is after appearing there now, and I and I do like the the Ed, and and it's something we haven't touched on, but it was very much around uh, the diversity and inclusion and how it can be used to broaden skill sets. So I might just ask for a comment from from maybe yourself or Helen, um, Patrick. Yeah, so so from our side, um, just from a diversity perspective, I mean, we have uh, four male, two female on the board, but it didn't happen by design; it just happened organically. Um, just from the skill sets perspective. Um, but but we're always open to if you have the right attitude and you know even when we're going to the stage now where we would potentially be looking at additional board members it's always it's just for the right motives and the attitude um, that they bring to the company that's what we really focus on. Mm -hmm. um, Adam? Yeah and you know what I would say is when you're looking for these people cast your net really wide you know don't don't you know don't don't be too narrow like lots of people have skills and experience in other businesses or other areas that can be applicable and I think if you have like Patrick is saying you just have that open view and you're casting a net reading wide I think you're likely to get do you know what I mean more diversity and you know it's a I for me you know diversity goes like well beyond gender so you know you think about even cultures and you know if I think of like the the benefit we got in that experience the board member who had uh, lived and worked in Japan for a long number of years brought you know so there, there's lots of different ways of, of, of looking at this but I, I would say you know just cast your net really wide and and you know include lots of people for consideration and I think the best people for the stage of the journey you're on right now will sort of come will filter up out of that and um, that'd be just my feeling on it yeah.
Tom, just the, the last question I would say is in terms of signposting um, anybody that's interested in exploring this further, useful resources or, or bodies that exist um, and anybody that you could recommend um, that, you know, might might be worth looking at, um, you know, for sample contracts uh, to get an understanding of the current picture. Obviously, Helen, you talked about the length of contracts, but, you know, what's included, incentivizing them, et cetera, et cetera. Was that a question yeah. of me or Helen? I'm going to go with Helen and deflect that. No, I was going to go with you, Tom, because yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah, I'm yeah. not. I'm not certain that there is, and maybe, maybe actually kicking it back to you guys, maybe it is something that you could like a small resource because I think I mean there are some bodies like you know the the institute directors, but mm. I think they're very focused on the um, fiduciary side, you know, and the governance that piece, whereas. And I think obviously I'm not saying that's not important. I think it's really important. But I think there's a lot of other things that probably scaling companies are trying to get from their board. Um, and that, you know, you know, there it possibly would be good to have a repository. I would say try and talk to somebody who's, you know, who's on the journey, been on the journey, if possible, you know, and, and what they did and what worked well and what didn't, you know. And the other thing if to watch there is you do need to make sure that you have um DNO insurance, uh, because I think a lot of yeah. people. You know, it's the first question I must say I would ask if I'm asked to be on a board is to the company have that, uh, you know, so there's there's a couple of those things that you can have in place and that, you know, make you look better, if you like, as you're approaching people. Um, but but maybe it is particularly around the contract size, because you don't want very complicated contracts, but you do want to get the key couple of things like what support do you expect them to give? What sort of time commitment? And then, um, you know, what sort of duration? Are you anticipating the person would be a board member? For? I mean, a, a big thing that I've heard come for, come out from from both of you is obviously to look inside your own network and and to ask your network uh, and ask around, you know, as to other people who are ahead of you on that journey who have maybe been through that experience and what their experience was and what they might they may have some insights to share. So you yeah. know, I suppose that would be a big thing is to to leverage your own network. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I think typically if you approach people even who are on the fringes of your network and just ask them for a half hour call for a bit of advice or do they have a template or do they like people are generally very happy to share um, yeah. to share that kind of information. So, yeah. Uh, okay, well, look, I'm going to uh, leave it there with you guys. So I just wanted to say thank you very much uh, to you both for, for coming on board and sharing your experiences. Uh, I find it to be very, very insightful. Just to say, watch this space in terms of uh, board and uh, supports from EI. Look, at the very least, uh, the one thing we're very, very good at doing is opening doors for people and doing introductions. So if you are aware of other companies that are further down the path and you have no way of, of uh, reaching out to them, um, I would say in the first instance, talk to your development advisor, uh, especially if they're an EI client company, it makes it very easy for us to, to be able to do that. So next month's session is on the 27th of July, and it's around obtaining funding for scale. And we're going to be discussing uh, funding strategies, how to engage with your investors in a meaningful way, how to articulate your business in terms that your investors will understand. Believe me, that is a huge one that the, um, uh, particularly Irish people and Irish businesses have a hard time in doing it. Uh, how to select the right investor. It's really not the first guy or person that comes along. Um, and we're going to hear from Matthew O'Dowd. He's the director of the Irish branch of NUMIS. Uh, and then we're going to have Conor McCarthy of uh, the... the CEO and founder of Flipdish. So that's the mobilized focus takeaway delivery ordering service, or you may have all heard about it as uh, one of Ireland's tech unicorns. So they're going to, to speak to us particularly about the number of funding rounds that the, the Flipdish has gone through and how they did it. Uh, so again, thanks to everybody who participated in this. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, Helen. Uh, and thank you to the team uh, behind uh, making sure all these things go well. So if you want to catch this recording again later on, I'd encourage you to go to our um, Global uh, Ambition uh, website and look at client solutions and events and see uh, our past webinars, but also the webinar we've got coming up next month. So thank you all again. Take care. Thank you.